The following is presented as an entertainment program emphasizing folklore. It is not intended as legal or medical advice in any way and should not be used to replace the advice of legal or medical professionals. New World Witchery is a Patreon-supported podcast. This episode is brought to you by listener Sierra, upon whom we are bestowing the fruits of our latest quest into the other world, three pomegranate seeds. We hear they are very lucky for whoever eats them, so let us know how that goes. If you'd like to become a patron and help support the show while also getting some great perks, please visit www.patreon.com slash newworldwitchery where you can pledge a dollar a month or whatever you can to help us mount the rescue mission to get Sierra back from the clutches of the strange pale man who claims we stole those seeds. Whatever, dude. <laughs> who counts how many pomegranate seeds they've got on your salad anyway? <laughs> oh, and thanks to all of our listeners. <laughs> Are you looking for magic? Maybe magic that lives right where you do? If so, join us aboard our broomsticks and ride with us from the Atlantic to the Pacific, from the Yukon to the Yucatan, and find magic that's right outside your front door or just off of Route 66. Whether you're in the Windy City or the Crescent City, the city that never sleeps, or the city of brotherly love, we've got enchantment for you. I'm Corey. And I'm Lane. And this is New World Witchery. Tonight, we're counting our blessings and seeing if good things do come in threes, sevens, nines, or more. We're discussing magical numbers and numerology. I can already tell this is going to be one of those episodes. Yep. Yep, it is. <laughs> I'm hopped up on, on Zazu Juice, like I said, and you are... I hopped up on Mountain Dew. Yeah, fr- frisky at the late night hours, so... Yeah. Yeah. It is the latest we've recorded in quite a while. It is indeed, yes. And I am a bit slap happy, so. That's all right. I think we can make that work. And we're talking about something which is really funny. You you kind of proposed this when we we were planning out kind of what we're going to be doing for the coming year, or at least the okay. first quarter of the coming year. You kind of proposed this as, I, I don't even call it like an afterthought, but just something you were like, oh yeah, I was thinking about this. And as soon as you said it, it was like, well, yeah, of course. Why haven't we done that? And we both kind of have been thinking, like, why have we not done this topic before? So Seriously. Yeah. We never. This is the first time. How many number jokes can we make? Right. Or can, can I make anyway? Corey's above that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm above nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad you're down here with me. <laughs> if there's a pun to be had, I'm crawling through that gutter. <laughs> so. Exactly. Yes. All right. So, yes, the the first. Yes. First, we're doing on on numbers, but it's so important in witchcraft. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I'm excited to talk about it. Yeah. And I think some of the reason that we sort of have missed it is that it, it, get, it gets folded into everything. So it's it just, does. you know, numbers are a part, like we'll talk about like, do this three times or, you know, do this for seven days or blah, blah, blah. We just haven't separated it as its own topic before, but we should, we should absolutely do that. So we're going to kind of tackle it from a, you know, a number of different angles. <laughs> Told you, Perfect. right there with the, in the gutter. Okay, <laughs> so yeah, so we're going to kind of cover a few different things having to do with numbers, everything from kind of like actual kind of numerological, like what is your you know your birth number kind of a thing, which I think you're going to kind of cover with us, and then I've got some folkloric stuff about kind of some of the different numbers and what those can mean. Talk about kind of personal experiences with numbers, maybe a little bit too. So just a lot to do. So. Okay. Yes. Innumerable things to do, perhaps. I don't know. <laughs> it's going to get worse. It's going to get worse. I'm okay with that. Yes. It's a, <laughs> it makes me think, I, before we, of course, we're going to, I mean, have to re- reference a meme at some point, right? But it makes me think of that. Have you seen the, the it's, it was this like snapshot of like a Tumblr post or something like that. That's like two people talking, you know, the dialogue format. Mm. And the first mm-hmm. person is like, oh, who's your favorite fictional vampire? And the, other person says, oh, it's the one from Sesame Street. Oh, he doesn't count. I assure you, he does. <laughs> I love that one. <laughs> I assure you, he does. He does. <laughs> yes. So, yeah, we're going to be counting, counting. Okay, so where do you, where do you want to start with this? Well, you wrote an excellent outline. Do you want to just follow the hat? Sh- sure, yeah. I didn't know if you wanted to start. Well, actually, I'm, I'm going to break my outline a little bit because... Okay. Down there, kind of where you started adding notes on 
numerology. That's the thing I think we need to maybe address first is okay. this kind of big picture concept of like, what is numerology? Because I think the individual numbers are going to be their own thing. Mm-hmm. But what is this kind of bigger picture concept of, you know, numerology when we talk about magic? Well, Buckland talks about it a lot, Raymond Buckland. And this isn't really a book that I reference a lot. Mm-hmm. I read it growing up when I was getting like you know, super into Wicca and witchcraft and finally like re or I, I never owned it. I had borrowed it, but I bought it recently secondhand. And yeah, it's just interesting to go through and I, I, I don't know anyway, but he talks a, a lot about numerology and finding your, your birth number, which mine is seven, by the way, Corey, do you know yours? If I remember correctly, mine winds up being two, who, but I'll okay. kind of calculate it as, as you go through here and, okay. and double check it. Okay. But he basically says that your birth number is unchangeable. It's like the one thing about you you can't really change is when you were born. And what you can change your name. And so you to have a name that balances with, that lines up with um, your birth name is just better for your magic in general, I guess, is what he's asserting in that because of the balance of it okay so yeah um he kind of encourages you to you know explore different names and um and then there's also like some that are attached to letters and it just depends because there's two different kinds of numerology i believe okay which is like Pythagorean and Chaldean. Okay, oh, is it C H A L D E N? Yes. Chaldean or Chaldean? Yeah. I think it's Chaldean. Mm-hmm. So let's see. In Chord Magic, Brandy Williams talks about it. This was published, I think, last year. And I was like, surely she does, because so much of Chord Magic and Not Magic is about counting the different knots and strands in your chord and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, she has the Pythagorean number chart. Let's see. The Chaldean mathematics of Babylonian mapped mathematicians, excuse me, a (laughs) Babylon. I think that might be a Babylon. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Map numbers to spiritual energies. The Greek philosopher Pythagoras saw the order of the cosmos in geometrical shapes. Magic workers still use the Chaldean and Pythagorean numerology systems. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, and yeah, and goes into it uh, from there. And so like, she has a little quick reference thing that I like. So number seven for me is thinker. Um, the strength would be seeker after truth, which I think that kind of describes me. Um, and then the flaw would be critical. And yeah, that's pretty, pretty on brand, especially with like my Virgo traits. That's like a huge one is critical, critical, you know, like that's mm-hmm. one of the <laughs> downfalls. Another thing I really like about this book is that she talks about her personal number meanings and how they can change for you. You know, she says like most number systems, you know, kind of go to 10. We have 10 fingers, Mm -hmm. but you may have been born with like an extra or with one less. And you might be able to use that to your advantage in a, you know, just because you have your own kind of personal numerology. And I thought that was really interesting. But then there's also, um, a way, and I don't, I wish I'd done more research on it now. There's a different way of counting. Um, so if you take your thumb and tap each knuckle, you get 12. Mm-hmm. And that's a really great way to do hours and time because you have, you know, 12 on one hand, 12 on the other, and that's day and night or, you know, AM, PM. Mm-hmm. And that's really helpful for me because I am terrible at like military time and adding up hours and be like okay well wait if that's I'm just I'm so bad at it so I can be like okay you know this is one o'clock and then however many hours from now and I just count it out of my knuckles it's just easier so anyway that's a different way of doing things like a base 12 I guess one would say again not a mathematician or of any type of sort I failed college algebra the first time (laughs) I took it so (laughs) let's just put that out there but I just I don't know I just like completely info dumped what what do I need to go back to? No, no, that's good. So, yeah. And so you've got these kind of two different, well, back some multiple different systems, it sounds like. Mm-hmm. And so it's it's almost like 
like an astrology sort of thing where the number, and I've heard it referred to as things like a life number or a life path number or th- things like that as well, where like you have this number that sort of defines your personality traits. Mm-hmm. Is that something that you're kind of subscribing to or do you feel like this is, there's, there's some flexibility to that? I mean, I think there's always flexibility with it. You know, like even astrology stuff, I'm not a hundred percent on, you know, and then right. a lot of people aren't as well but then again some people are like super on board with them like oh yeah you're definitely a Capricorn you know like that type of thing right. but so there's there's always a little bit of give and take but for the most part I think yeah it's it ends up being pretty accurate and like and what's interesting to me is that like astrology they oftentimes start taking into account like your position right your latitude your longitude the hour of your birth and things like that but with this it's really just kind of the day the year the month right Mm -hmm. so i think that's kind of interesting um and then also the thing about him you know buckland specifically saying like oh well it needs to kind of balance to your name right and this comes down to the idea of a lot of people within um wicca and and similar traditions take on a magical name and so they might want to make their names numerologically aligned right so that their name winds up adding up to the same kind of number because you can give each letter value a, a numerical value too. So you want all of those letters to add up to be the same number as your birth, birth number. Right. Yeah. And the way he does it is just one, two, three, four, one through nine. And then you just write the alphabet and, mm-hmm. you know, wrap back around. So a through I is one through nine and then J through R one through nine again, and then S through Z one through eight. And then obviously yeah. there's no, third one for the number nine so and that it's pretty easy that way and so yeah he's it, it's it, it's like you said he even says that's why we take a magical name to mm-hmm. ensure that it it balances and yeah i don't necessarily subscribe to that i think i right. did it, at one point i did think it was pr- pretty important but i don't remember doing like numerology with it so i'm not sure if i got that from Buckland himself or, or not. Yeah. And I mean, I could see a really interesting thing kind of happening if you, if you adopted that name with that number and then also could calculate, for example, something sort of planetary into it as well. Cause I know not a lot of the number systems also tie into ideas of kind of like planetary numbers, things like that, you know, connections with Zodiac signs and things, you know, there's a lot that you can do and to have something where like all those things align, I can really see how that would feel very empowering to somebody to feel like when they are that identity thinking with that number and, you know, in this specific kind of situation, like I can see how that's kind of like, oh yes, everything is aligned. <laughs> all the, everything is right. The magic is is flowing through me. Like I can really see how that could be empowering for somebody too. So, I mean, I feel like I can kind of speak to that in a certain way because, you know, I do have, <laughs> I call it like not to bring it up too much, but like my muggle name and mm-hmm. then, you know, which is my first name. And then my middle name is kind of my magical name. And I've yeah. gone by Lane for witchy type things. And, you know, and a few friends actually now call me, you know, Lane and know me as Lane. It just in my regular life as well. Yeah. And that's, that's been interesting. So yeah, it, it's true. And it, they do have uh, different feelings to them. Uh, Mm -hmm. My first name, I've never really connected with much, you know, but my mom loves it. And like, that's something that's kind of important to her. So I don't know. It's just never something I thought of like completely changing, Mm -hmm. but my, my first name is like kind of cheerleadery and I don't know. It just has a a lot of baggage to it that I just don't identify with. Right. And Lane just feels, you know, it's one syllable. It's just, it's not quite common, but it's still you know, just a, a, a word. Like it's, it's good. I, I'm I, so yes, I agree with everything you had kind of posited that it does feel empowering. It does have like a different feel to it. And, but then again, like I'm kind of obsessed with names anyway, if a, you're a person who is not, then it, it might not be for you. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's all about how much are you willing to put into it? And that's really going to be true for a lot of the, the numbers things, because we're going to talk about some of the kind of superstitions and folklore around the numbers and some of these are ones that people are very invested in. And some of these are ones where people are very skeptical. And I think you're fine to be anywhere on that spectrum with these because there's, it holds the value that you ascribe to it. So, mm-hmm. and that's, that's, I think, true in a lot of magical situations. Like sometimes things have independent, 
you know, value and power and things like that. And sometimes it really comes down to, you know, because you have invested something in this, it then takes on the significance it does. So, right. So, so, okay. Just out of curiosity. So I'm a, I'm a, I'm a little trepidatious. So my, if you add all mine together, Mm -hmm. I do get a two, but I get an 11 before I get a two. And I have heard that 11 is supposed to be different. Ooh. Yeah. That's not what I've run into, but I feel like I've heard that as well, just because it's, you get into the repeating numbers and Mm -hmm. that's, that's been super big lately. Like the angel numbers I've heard them called. And I think I told you this already, Corey, but I found at five below like keychains that said something about angel numbers and they were Mm -hmm. different ones. You know, there was one, 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 two, two, two. I mean, just a bunch of different, different ones. And it's just fascinating, like seeing how much uh, magic, I guess, is kind Mm -hmm. of become mainstream. Well, yeah. And I mean, I think we've seen that over the past few years, but truly, you know, astrology has long been, far more mainstream than a lot of other types of magic. And numerology has always been kind of right in there. I mean, you think about like when you get a fortune cookie, right? Mm-hmm. You read your fortune on one side and you flip it over, lucky numbers, numbers right? Mm-hmm. So and most people have, you know, what they consider their lucky number. So, right. which I guess is a good place to kind of enter into this is, you know, what makes a number a lucky number? I mean, do you have, do you have a lucky number? I feel like I have a few, like... I, 13 is mine and my husband's but mm-hmm. like it, it's not it's not one we chose to like be edgy or anything it, like oh 13 it was just like that was the day we had our first date mm-hmm. and it was a rehearsal dinner for his stepsister she was getting married and mm-hmm. you know their wedding was like the 14th of may which was a very you know <laughs> like typical wedding date uh-huh. and So the day before was the rehearsal. Well, that was kind of our our first date because we had been friends for a long time. Hey, do you want to come to this rehearsal with me? Yeah, sure. Uh, Well, it turned into a date and then we kind of knew we would be getting married like from that day. But that's that's neither here nor there. So like when we got married, we wanted it to also be on that 13th. We had to change the month because I was still in college. Yes, we got married very young. (laughs) (laughs) And um so it's just always been our number. But then like when it comes to me, I've always liked three and seven. Mm. I've always like wished on one on eleven eleven. Mm-hmm. And then not I don't really wish, but kind of, I don't know. I, I notice it a lot. I take notice of my birthday, eight thirty, just the, mm-hmm. the time, eight thirty on the clock. But so yeah, what about you? What are some of your lucky numbers if you have any? Um, my biggest one is eight. That's always been mine since I was a kid. Uh-huh. Just, you know, I always felt, and it's, there, there's nothing substantial to it other than the fact that the eight always appealed to me because it was an infinity symbol. <laughs> and there's something about that, that I really love that sort of endlessness of the eight and it's paired, which, I mean, you know, I'm a Gemini. So there's a little bit of that. It's like kind of a paired mm. sort of two circles paired kind of a thing. And then it's also this kind of like, I don't know. It's this, it's a, it's a cube, you know, it's a two by two by two. Right. And just, you know, anytime I got, you know, selected as number eight or had an eight in my number for anything that was going on in school, I was always like, okay, things are going to work out great. And like, I always, it it always felt like that was true. And I don't know, like, I think if I took a statistical, like (laughs) actuarial approach to it, I probably would be like, no, it was a 50, 50 shot either way. Every time, but it felt like that number had power for me. And so since then I've, I've long felt like an eight or an eight connected number is, is very potent for me. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I love that. And do, there's just something about that that has appealed to me. Do you, do you particularly like multiples of eight when it comes to other like bigger numbers? Like for example, your age, you know, like when you hit a year, that's a multiple of eight. Is that like a good thing for you or is it really just the number eight? You know, I honestly don't think I could tell you if that were true or not. I, I do know that like the number 64 has a lot of appeal to me. Eight times eight, right? Right. So it's a square of a cube, right? Mm-hmm. Which is a, which is a whole, it's a whole other thing, right? And so that's got a, a lot of appeal for, for me, but, and of course there's a Beatles song, you know, 
Will you still will you still need me? Will you still feed me when Aww. I'm 64? Right? That's, yeah, that's I a good that's one. Let's interrupt you or to go back mm-hmm. too much. But so from Brandy Williams' book again, her chord magic, where she talks about having like you know the personal values, she goes into hers, and I thought they were really fascinating, and I wanted to talk about them with you. Yeah. Okay. She says one is unity, two is partnership, three is movement, four is stability, and five is dynamic energy. Mm-hmm. Then I began to think of begin to think of numbers as multiples. Six is two times three, which is partnership plus movement. One way I understand that is through the hermetic idea as above, so below. Seven is the number of planets known to the ancients. Eight is two times four, stability mm-hmm. plus partnership. Finally, nine is three times three, the perfect expression of the unfolding of movement. And that's on page 53 of uh, Chord Magic, String, Yarn, Twists, and Knots or excuse me, tapping into the power of string yarn, twists and knots for anybody who wants to check that out. It's a really cool book. She goes into a lot of detail. I recommend it if anybody is interested, but yeah, I really liked that. And, you know, she says four is stability. And I immediately think of like the legs of a chair or a Mm -hmm. table. And that makes complete sense to me. Mm -hmm. Five being dynamic energy again, makes sense. I think of a, a pentagram and, you know, the, the fifth, I guess, element to being spirit Mm -hmm. and all that. So yeah. And I just, I've never kind of thought of it as one through five and then building on top of those. I've always thought of it as one through nine and having Mm -hmm. each individual one. So I I don't know. I really liked that. I I need to correct you on something. The fifth element is not spirit. The fifth element. Oh, it's Lilu Dallas. Lilu Lilu (laughs) multi-pass. Sorry. (laughs) Come Dallas. Okay. Sorry. I love that movie so much. <laughs> I knew you'd at least be on the same page with me. Oh, fully on the same page. <laughs> when I said it, I was, yeah. <laughs> you were winning. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm curious also because, I mean, obviously, Randy Williams' book is about, you know, knots and strings and things like that. As somebody who has n- knit for a long time, do you work numerological magic into the things you knit ever? Or do you kind of have to sort of just go, no, it's a pattern and I have to do the pattern by a certain number. You can. I mean, you can, if you're comfortable with knitting, you know, after a long while, you definitely can. You can fudge things. You can add in stitches and decrease them away a little bit later. And it doesn't really affect the the fit all that much usually. So yeah, I think you, you can, but usually for me, it's like, mm, let me just follow this pattern. And, but, you know, that's you start working in the colors of it and the maybe the pattern of the fair isle that you're working on and is snowflakes and you only work on it like when you're trying to conjure some snow or something mm-hmm. i don't know but I'm, I'm just saying there's you know there's there is a lot of things to do in uh knitting magic and numerology is definitely one of them I, it's just not really for me yeah fair enough yeah <sighs> yeah no that makes sense yeah that does take me to not magic as well, because, you know, one of the first kind of spells I remember coming across and remember doing was chord magic. And that's I, my first encounter was Teen Witch by Silver Ravenwolf. Mm-hmm. And I have bookmarked it. Let me find it. I still have my old copy. It makes me happy. <laughs> the old does, cover, you know. Does it ha- have all the teenagers on the cover kind of staring at you craft style? Yes. Well, okay. so there, I, I have two because, yeah, I don't know. I know. So there's like the, that nineties one that's like anim, uh-huh. not animate, but like illustrated. Uh huh. And then there's the three of it's black and white with like the teenage girls kind of laughing and tops and just looking like a Noxima commercial. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so anyway, I love them both. Okay. So she begins, you know, by not of one, the spells begun. So I feel like that immediately just sank into my brain and I just think of one as you know as starting things as uh, not to borrow from Brandy Williams too much but a movement you know like just okay like we're getting we're getting ready things are on their way is kind of how I view it and Mm -hmm. I really feel like a lot of my number associations were influenced by this rhyme I guess is my point so by not of one the spells begun not of two the words are true by not of three. This this says it comes to be. I feel like I've read so mote it be, so shall it be, you know, several different ones. By not of four, this power is in store. Not of five, the spell's alive. 
Not of six, the spell is fixed. Not of seven, the answer is given. Not of eight, I meld with fate. I don't remember that one. <laughs> but not of nine, the thing is mine. I do remember yeah. that one. So nine being like completion and yeah, I guess kind of the the end all beat all of them. <laughs> yeah. For me. Yeah, and that's int- when we get to nine as we kind of work through all the numbers, I think that'll be, it'll be interesting to to see how that kind of plays out. Cause it is, I do remember doing chord magic as an early thing, but I remember it being the, the one from Scott Cunningham with the Egyptian knot amulet that you would tie around your wrist to reduce, you know, it was supposed to help d- dissipate headaches and things like that. And that always had, I think seven knots in it. So I'd, it never went to nine. So. Oh, yeah. Okay. But interesting. Hmm. <laughs> Well, good. Okay. Well, before we dive into the actual numbers themselves, there is also the phenomenon of counting things. And we've talked about that plenty of times on the show. I don't want to like dive too deeply into that. Cause like, I know that one that we've brought up several times is obviously the one for sorrow, two for joy, three for a girl, four for a boy. Right. Yeah. Which is the, it's the magpie counting charm or the counting crows charm. Not the same as sha la 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 ya. <laughs> Huh? <laughs> I love that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It doesn't, it does not summon Mr. Jones. It does not, you don't have to say it in a long December. It's all, it's all very well. Anyway. So yeah. So the, yeah, the, the, the counting magpies charm is supposed to be this, like you count things, however, however many of something you see and that reveals something to you. It's not necessarily like, numerology in the same sense that we've been talking about, but it is the sense of um, numbers being tied to a magical outcome. So I thought it was worth at least mentioning that. Yeah, I agree. Also, it reminds me of just witches and counting being involved in the like kind of, or not always witches, but a lot of supernatural creatures needing to count things in order to pass through, I don't know, like a threshold or something like that. Like, you know, counting grains of rice or pennies or whatever, why, which is why, you know, the, the count on Sesame street is a vampire. Right. Yes. Cause he's compelled to count things. You exactly. Know? So there's that as well. I assure you he does. I assure uh, you he counts. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, that's the only thing protecting, protecting all of the dozens of Sesame street is his obsession with <laughs> With numerology. <laughs> Otherwise they'd all be, you know, a bloody mess on the streets. So, but yeah, no, that is, that is true. Yeah. So, and th- it is something to think about. Like, you know, we, if we are magical folk, we, we do tune into things like that. So it makes sense that, you know, if we're going to count something like crows, we would also count something like pebbles or grains of rice because we need that information. Like that's what gives us access to this otherworldly power you know, and so to enter a house, it's sort of like the house's name, right? In order to know the house's name, well, now you have to count everything that's at the threshold. So that's why you put down rice or salt or whatever, because otherwise you don't know the house's name. So the house won't give you access or something like that. So that makes that's, sense. yeah, that's an interesting way of looking at that. And I mean, who knows if that's accurate or not, but no, but it's kind it. of in within that folkloric vein. Of love it. it. Yeah. 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 It would absolutely make sense. That, yeah. that feels very like, something that would be in a Neil Gaiman novel and like it just feels right and you're like oh I don't know how he tapped into that but that's just right you know yeah we call that the folkloresque something that like feels feels like folklore but we can't quite prove it is mm-hmm. okay <laughs> yeah. love it yeah um, okay. I do let's see so there's a lot of weather ones I'm just gonna throw a bunch of them out here let me know if you do any of them okay counting fogs in August to determine snows in winter Counting stars in the ring around the moon to tell how many days until a storm. Uh-uh. Counting number of days on the day of the first snow since the last new moon to know how many snows there will be that year. No, I've never heard of that one. And counting number of sunny days between July and September and then doubling it to know how many days we'll have of cold in the winter. Uh-uh. Well, there you go. I think there's also counting the stripes on a woolly worm. Yes, I I have heard that one, but so I like, have not I've not seen a woolly worm in years and it like yeah. the realization of that a few months ago made me really really sad. Yeah. We we still had them up in Pennsylvania when I lived there, so oh, they're not good. gone. I mean, it, to be fair, I'm not outside as much as I used to be when I was a oh, kid and true, saw them yeah. frequently, but mm-hmm. it still made me sad. So, yeah, but I I did yeah. we did do that. Yep. So, yeah. So, those are all kind of like 
practical ones where you're sort of trying to predict weather and things like that. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting because there are some that are scientifically accurate Mm -hmm. that like we don't, I I feel like like we kind of didn't know and then it turned out to be. Um, I mean, I feel like everyone knows about the 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 thunder one. Oh, the thunder, yeah. Oh, yeah. And the cricket one. Yeah, I was going to say those two, actually. So, yeah, that's perfect. The thunder one, which is, you know, you hear... um, see the lightning you count you know one mississippi whatever you want to do and that's kind of roughly the amount of miles away it is or if that's completely too inaccurate for you i just like to count between each one and then compare and be like okay it's moving away okay like you know it's getting lesser that that's good that's what i need to know and then yeah the cricket one being like however frequently they're Chirping corresponds to the temperature outside. Yeah, it's a certain number of chirps per minute. And then you add, I think you add 30 or something like that. And that's the temperature outside or something like that. So is that in Fahrenheit or Celsius? I don't remember. And I really, (laughs) and uh, that's really coming out of my my head. I don't remember. There may be a completely different number, but it is, please, please go Google that for more information because it's very widespread. Mm -hmm. I just don't remember the exact number, but it's, you count the number of chirps from a cricket in in a certain amount of time. And then add a very specific number to it, and you get within a couple degrees of the temperature. So, yeah, yeah, I just I think that's fascinating. So there is kind of incentive to to count things that, yeah, might not seem correlated. I guess. Yeah, yeah. It's I mean, this is and so much of so much of I think what witchcraft came down to was seeing patterns that didn't necessarily have a logical sense, but had an intuitive sense and then mm-hmm. sort of being able to pull on the threads of those connections and counting is part of that. So I did see in, you know, before we move on from counting, the act of counting itself can be both good and bad luck. So like, you know, they say, don't count your blessings. If you do count the number of good things you have, oftentimes that's sort of an invitation to have something taken away from you or, one of the weird ones was if you count the number of teeth in a comb or the number of hairs on somebody's head, that's bad luck. So you shouldn't mm-hmm. do that. But then if you do feel like you're having bad luck, you can count backwards and that will in theory dissipate the bad luck. Although if you're not having bad luck, you shouldn't do it because then you're inviting something to happen when you get to one. <laughs> so, <laughs> so be careful about that. So I don't know. Is that any, any of that stuff ring true been familiar to you? For some reason, I keep thinking of like throwing salt over your shoulder. Like it's just like the backwards mm-hmm. motion of it, if if that could even be called that. I don't know, but yeah, there's there's something about like doing something that you wouldn't normally do. Like you, I feel like you could even do like say the alphabet backwards. You know, like it wouldn't. Mm-hmm. It doesn't have to be the numbers necessarily. But, yeah, that, yeah, that's that practice of reading free, right? Where you're like, we, we read a passage backwards if we think we've been cursed by it, and that removes the curse. So, oh. yeah. All right. Okay. What about evens and odds? Hmm. What are you? Evens or odds? Well, I'm eight, so I tend so to go evens. evens, but I also know that odds are supposed to be more appealing just in general. So, like, I know, that, like, when they say that you're – creating art or uh, painting or anything like that, that you should always paint an odd number of objects. Uh So because it's more visually appealing to the eye, Uh which I think is interesting because like that goes back a long way. Like there's a quote from Virgil from 40 BCE where he says, odd numbers, please the gods. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. I mean, interesting. I, yeah. I prefer odd numbers as well. Like I said earlier, three, five, seven, generally kind of what I tend towards. But yeah, I, I don't know why. Yeah. I'm not sure. I'm not sure why. Because we also, we're really interested in symmetry. So we like things yeah. to have like bilateral symmetry and binary symmetry and things like that. And like we obviously live in an age where everything is very binary in terms of its you know, the digital age is, is all coded in binary in, in certain ways. So, mm-hmm. but odd numbers are more appealing to us. So, and like that, that carries through. So like, I mean, I found examples in Spencer's Fairy Queen, in Shakespeare, things like that. The 21 gun salute is a 21 gun salute because it is three sevens, which is, you know, product of two primes that is an odd number itself. 
Yeah. And so it's a, you know, good luck number. So. Huh. Never thought about that one. Yeah. Now, it is interesting. So there were a few things where odd numbers were bad luck, which is if you have an odd number of people in a kitchen or at a table or in a funeral or wedding party. So you're supposed to have balance there. Mm -hmm. See, I've never heard of the odd number of people at a table, just like 13. And the first mm -hmm. one to, you know, to, to leave to get is, up. Yeah. is one kind of cursed, I guess. Right. Which supposedly comes from Judas. the last yeah. supper, right? Right. Which is, so I actually did a paper on numerology in college uh, in my Tolkien class. I did numerology in Lord of the Rings and Silmarillion mm -hmm. and all that. And a lot of the numerology sources I found were like that were, you know, as academic as possible, drew a lot from the Bible. Like mm -hmm. it was, you know, a lot of people are just convinced that a lot so much of where our associations with numbers come from the bible so anyway which is not inaccurate i mean the, no. the bible is full of numerological you know importance there's so many there's so much emphasis put on very specific things like the number 40 or the number seven yeah. number three like all those things are incredibly important and exactly. so they're very influential but yeah. we'll isn't the bible those. the most alluded to like piece of literature in, in the world anyway I mean, I hesitate to say that because I feel like it's a very Western centric. I think mm. in the West, that's true. I don't know. Like, I think if you. I'll, I'll say. Yeah. In the English language. In, sure. Yeah. In that I, there, I feel very comfortable with that being. And I would say like in large, largely Western culture, that's probably very true. I, th I think there are probably some other things that get alluded to close to as much, if not more, once you kind of get outside of the Western world. But, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. But yeah, there's a lot of numbers that kind of get tapped into there. Even numbers, I just wanted like, I'm not going to go too much further with this, but I am curious. Again, like you said, that's the one that sort of seems like it's associated with negative stuff. And there was even a story in Vance Randolph's Ozark Magic and Folklore where he talks about like this guy who, like if he would go buy cattle, right? And this is, this is true for a lot of different livestock folklore as well. So like chickens, cattle, things like that. Um, if he bought, uh, he would only buy an odd number of whatever the animals were. And if he then found that like one was missing, so if he had 41 cows and he found that there were only 40 when he left, then he would either immediately try to buy another cow so that there would be 41, or he would sell one of them super cheap so that they'd be down to 39 because otherwise they wouldn't fatten up properly. Like there would be a, 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 a poor batch of livestock. Right. So I thought that was really interesting. And that's true also like for like, you're not supposed to have an odd number of gums in your beehive. You're not supposed to oh. count odd or count. I'm sorry. You're not supposed to have an even number of bee gums in your beehive or not have even number of like ears of corn on a stalk. They, like if you, if you count them and you find that, then it's bad luck. So oh. that was interesting. Miss Elish, <laughs> uh -huh. who we love, of course, has a little bit in El encyclopedia of 5,000 spells it's on page 1064 and she says something that i thought we also could talk about indeed all the most magically powerful numbers three seven nine and their multiples are odd however one must also take into consideration that at least since pythagoras if not earlier odd numbers have been classified as masculine and the even numbers feminine whether this has anything to do with the prestige accorded odd numbers may be worthy of study hmm. <laughs> Do you feel like that's true? You know, I've always viewed uh, odd numbers as masculine and even as feminine. Huh. And I don't know where I got that notion. I I really do feel like it was from a book somewhere. But the, like the the tendency to odd numbers has, has kind of always been like that. That feels innate to me. But it, it could not, like, I'm, I'm not arguing that it is. I'm just saying that's how it feels. But I definitely kind of, when I was learning about some of this more, like, woo-woo stuff in my, you know, my years, like I said, as I was kind of coming into witchcraft and Wicca, I really do think that I read that somewhere and it just stayed with me. That, yeah, mm -hmm. odd, uh, odds are masculine and even are feminine. That's fascinating. Yeah, I don't know that I would have thought that i mean it's interesting to me because like 
you know, and this is, this is awfully reductionist, but like, you know, I think of a, a thing that often gets ascribed to femininity, even though this is not strictly feminine, but pregnancy, right? Mm. So, you know, anybody can, can give birth, right? So that, that's, I'm not trying to like categorize beyond that, but just to say that there are a lot of people who sort of ascribe pregnancy to femininity, but nine would be the number associated there. So I think that's interesting. Mm. Yeah. I don't know. And then like, I think about, and this is also, this is also the, because the, it doesn't really exist, but the idea of like the, the triple goddess, the maiden mother and crone, but like, that's really kind of made up by Robert Graves. I believe, I believe it was Robert Graves. That maybe he's speaking out of turn on that, but this concept that was introduced much later than classical antiquity, although there are tri- triads of goddesses and things like that. But this yeah. And I think that crone. that imagery still really can work for people, myself yeah. included. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, not, like, yeah. yeah. You no, know, I, I mean, and I, I know you're, you're not trying to like downplay that or anything, but you know, someone who is listening to this for the first time may not, or us for the first time. Right. May not, may not know that. Yeah. Right. But yeah, like I found like some, I've had people point out a few gray hairs to me before, but mm-hmm. like I saw one visible for the first time in my uh-huh. own hair. And that was like, I don't know. It was just weird. It, like this, just this really visible sign of aging and having to be like, it's okay. You're coming into your, your crone years. It's all right. <laughs> it's okay. You and who then, are still in the spring of your life. <laughs> I am, I'm still f- firmly in mother territory, I think, but yeah. yeah, it's, it's coming. And I'm, I'm grateful that it, that it is. I'll just, I'll, and I'll try to remember that. <laughs> Winter is coming. Yes. No, that's, yeah, no, I, I, I get that. Yeah. No. And I mean, and I, I'm not trying to say that like the made mother crumb thing doesn't, doesn't work for people. It certainly does. I just wanted to, it's just that specific grouping is a more, cont- is a more recent sort of introduction, even mm-hmm. though the concept I think does exist potentially in, in older examples too, but that's another here there. But yeah, the idea of a triad, I just think it's really interesting that like, I'm not trying like it's I'm not trying to say like the even numbers are not feminine and the odd numbers are not masculine. Like, like I don't know. Like I just never thought of that. But like as soon as you started saying it, I was like, huh, that's interesting because like threes and nines feel very feminine linked to me, but I can also see what they're saying about this like masculine. I don't know. And and then like what would the planetary associations be too? Would like Venus be associated with certain numbers? Like I don't know. I just think it's interesting. Mm, yeah. Above my pay grade at the moment, I have not yep. done the research there, so I can't dive too far into it, <laughs> but maybe worthy of further exploration. Yes. Okay. Shall we do, shall we do this by the numbers? <laughs> yes. That was an overly long pause, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. Okay. Okay. So we're going to go through one through nine and then also kind of touch on zero and some other numbers just briefly. Mm-hmm. And we're going to kind of do this. We're just going to hit each number, say a couple quick things about it. And then I figured like, let's talk about kind of our really quick associations with these numbers too, if that's okay. Yeah. All right. One, we've got Here's the, loneliest number that's the first thing that comes to mind. Do. It's either that or one singular sensation. Like it's music. <laughs> <laughs> and so some of the stuff that I found on this, is the first of oh you okay yeah i'm good sorry all right the first of anything is often lucky so your first star of the night starlight star bright first star i see tonight Uh uh-huh first star of or first bird of spring the firstborn animals these are lucky things they're often taken as signs of what's to come so oh me oh you're firstborn there you go i'm the firstborn animal in my family (laughs) you are the firstborn (laughs) mammal in your generation that's great (laughs) Oh my God. Also the first of the month. So that's the rabbit rabbit day. Rabbit Those rabbit. Are, yep. Do exactly. You, okay. Do you want to know where I learned that from? Is it a, is it a card game? No, it's Nickelodeon. Oh, okay. Yeah. They had this, you know, like the little interstitials they used to do between shows uh-huh. and sometimes they would do like little trivia things and they would say beginning of a month, the first thing you should say should be like rabbit rabbit. And it's supposed to be good luck or something like that. And I, yeah. I just, I remember it little things like that it stuck with me and i was like thanks nickelodeon <laughs> That's yeah, still sometimes go. i will say rabbit rabbit teach new witchcraft that's, that's right doing. yep so yeah so and then also ones in repetition are lucky so this is the the angel number thing or the clock thing where you see like 111 or 1111 particularly mm-hmm. 
is thought to be kind of a powerful number. I know 11 is supposed to be a powerful number, which again, sort of derives from some biblical things, but yeah. Anything else for ones? What do you associate with ones other than the loneliest number? <laughs> like I said earlier, beginnings. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I don't mean to be crude either, but I, mm-hmm. it is quite phallic. You know, it's, mm-hmm. it, it, it's, you know, very much just, what am I? I'm trying to sound academic when talking about something that just looks like a penis. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and how do, how do I do that? I don't know, but Th- there. That was pretty good. You're, you're... I'll just leave it. I yeah. should have just left it. I made it weird. And here we are. <laughs> no, no, you can, you can continue playing with the phallus. It's fine. No, no, please. <laughs> I was very to be like, it's quite dildonic. I don't no, know. No. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, and there is so so for me, I also think of like monolith or like sort of mono, anything that's kind of like a, a singular thing, which does have a weirdly negative connotation or an ominous co- connotation to me. Like there's an omin- ominous nature to something that is a, a one. It just feels very like looming. Yeah. Well, it, I, I think of, I mean, we kind of talked about it the last time we recorded for our other podcast, <laughs> the, the monolith in the movie 2001. Mm-hmm. What, God, what is the full 2001 name? 2001 Space Odyssey. Thank you. And how like, yeah, just looming it is in the beginning. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, I also think of, you know, the Washington monument with that and I I've been to it and, you know, it's, it's nice. It's, lovely but i could i could see it being like kind of i don't know just like it, actually t- there there was a jeopardy question tonight about it and when it was first built somebody said it looked like a giant chimney like pe- mm. they, people didn't like it so i don't know i i am with you on that on just those like just one tall tower feeling really ominous yeah or, you know, anything that's kind of a one big, like, so even, you know, monotheism, and if somebody else is monotheistic, that's fine. But like, for me, one big looming force, one big looming God, one, one you know, thing that can control everything feels really overjuiced, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> let's divide that power up a little bit. You know? Someone needs to nerf the God. <laughs> yeah, a little bit, right? Like, we've, we've overperked this one, we got to. Like <laughs> to parcel this out. All right. Anything else for one? No. All right. Two. Uh, do you want to go through the ones that are in here? Double yolks in an egg are good luck. I've heard that. Mm-hmm. Uh, as are paired fruits, which are believed in folklore to lead to twins. Okay. Yep. Mm-hmm. Twins. Uh, a lot of lore about them being lucky. Also slightly supernatural or preternatural. Mm-hmm. So, of course, we have like Romulus and Remus. Twins mm-hmm. in Greek mythology, for example. Yep, Castor and um, Pollux. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. And then the popular folk belief that the left twins have healing powers, and that could be fraternal twins in the opposite sex. Yes. Mm-hmm. For the left twins, what what does that mean exactly? Right. So they are they're they're twins, but they are fraternal and opposite sex twins, right? So they're oh, not. Oh, so it, it has to be fraternal and opposite sex twins well Mm -hmm. every opposite sex twin is a fraternal twin right i don't know i think you can be an identical twin and have come from the same egg i don't know that's an interesting question i don't know maybe that's true i don't know (laughs) i don't know not not an expert on this i'm sure somebody will know and correct us on that so yeah and that's Um, fine please do but i do know that fraternal opposite sex twins in the folk folklore often get called left twins and the idea is that if they're the male left twin, they can blow an illness out of uh, a woman's mouth. And if they are a female left twin, they can do that for a male. So this is something like thrush. Like if you get thrush or a rash mm-hmm. or something like that, they can like blow on you and it heals it. So, so <laughs> never mind. No, nope, never mind. <laughs> no, nope. dying to know where you're going with that. <laughs> I think some people do. And no, nope, I'm just, I'm just going to leave it. Are we heading into dildonic territory again? <laughs> Okay, well, I have to. Okay, <laughs> with thrush being yeast, mm-hmm. basic, can you blow the yeast infection away? Like, are they becoming gynecologists? I mean, l- listen, if you don't have access to regular medical care, you got to do what you got to do, I guess. Also, uh, you should never blow air into no, the not vagina. Into. So, just no. FYI. 
Yeah. Do not motorboat is is not good. Oh God. What but am I? <laughs> where have we gone? What have we done? Yeah. Anything else on twos? Oh, anything that happens twice is bound to happen a third time. And yes, that is my mom is big with that one. Like, oh well, you know, celebrity deaths come in yep. threes. So I mean, yes, that is like talking about threes, but when something happens twice, it's always like, oh, but that's the signal. Like, you know, be ready for the third. Yeah. And you're always kind of waiting for that, that third thing to happen. Yeah. And then of course, like there's a confirmation bias thing that happens with that too. Cause of like, of course. Yeah. Like it does, it could have been like six months since the last one died. And you're like, Oh, like this minor B actor from <laughs> this film that I watched, you know, once 20 years ago, they died. That's the third one. You're like, well, was it? <laughs> like, was that the third? Yeah. Maybe they're still coming. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So it's just one of those things that like there is a confirmation bias. But there's you know, a lot of people believe in this. So like and this is also, you know, lightning never strikes twice, but if it does, it'll strike a third time. That's the the kind of like corollary to that. So mm. Yeah. Okay. So do you want to move on to three then? Yeah, let's do threes. And there I will say this, I'm not gonna dig into this very much, but if people are interested, there's a folklorist named Alan Dundas who did a an article that's all about the role of the number three in kind of Western folkloric thought and mythological thought. And this is like, if you've ever heard a fairy tale, right? They always do. It's There's always three sisters or three brothers, or they Mm go on three different adventures or they, you know, walk through three doors or go up three mountains. This is a, it's a repeated thing because the first one's the initiation. The second one is the, is the, the trial that is not passed. And the third one is this is the trial that, that is passed. Right. So Mm. I mean, and that's a big in the rule rules of comedy as well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And storytelling, just storytelling mm-hmm. in general. You know, we get a lot of three beats, as they're called. Um mm-hmm. in uh, you know, shows we talk about, movies we talk about. So yeah. Yep. Yeah. There's, and there's something that just like scratches something in our brain to have it gripped in threes. Yeah, and I will say like you know, it's it's a little reductive to say that there that it's only in kind of Western cultural frameworks, because I think that there's a lot of cultures around the world who do have sort of associations with threes, but there is something very distinctly like Western about kind of our, our obsession with threes. And it's not just like the Trinity is a thing, right? That the, the, the mm-hmm. Holy Trinity is definitely influential in here. Right. But even before the Trinity, there were concepts of things like land, sea, and sky. Like there were triads that existed in pre-Christian society Right. And it's it's been a very popular thing sort of in Western civilization for a very long time. So even to the point where I don't know if you've ever heard have you ever heard the expression third time's a charm? <laughs> yeah. Just goes a few. Back, yeah, it goes back to there's like a medieval poem called Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, where he says, I've bested thee twice and the third time will prove best. It's the long standing belief that third time's a charm. So Yep. I didn't even know that. I mean I've I've read that i i i make little air quotes because you know in school sure. like yeah. whatever it, it's <laughs> it's been a long time but <laughs> i do not remember that but that's neat that was back in your maiden days crone <laughs> <laughs> yes okay there's a ridiculous christmas movie on like netflix or something and this knight uh-huh. goes back in time or goes forward in time excuse me and it's because of a, a you know, like a witch that is trying to help him be you know a better person or whatever uh-huh. and it's ridiculous and she he like tries to find her and he's just walking around going old crone old crone <laughs> old crone <laughs> and my friend started calling me that because she thought it was funny and then my daughter started calling me that. <laughs> i have i have a christmas present that was addressed to old crone <laughs> you're like i'm gonna start cursing y'all if y'all don't stop this seriously no it's funny though it's oh. it's oh it makes me laugh so anyway That's good yeah very good that's me all right what about fours four okay let's see you, you said something about the, okay. thing, the, the dundas thing yes please yes okay so in that same essay that dundas talks about threes he also talks about the fact that once you kind of get outside of that western european not even western european that sort of like broadly euro centric kind of worldview there are other numbers that wind up being important and the one he points to the most is that in indigenous cultures in america the number four is usually much more of a holy or sacred number because it has to do with the four 
cardinal directions, the four key colors of red, and then either white or yellow, blue and black. So, you know, that's a, that's a really big deal for a number of indigenous, indigenous groups. So. Yeah. But that's fascinating to me because in, I believe in Chinese culture, four is very bad luck because mm-hmm. it sounds so si- I don't, I'm not sure if it sounds similar to or if it's written very similar to like the word for death I mm-hmm. think obviously I don't speak Chinese I don't know enough about it to you know speak with like a lot of authority on it but I do know that that's a thing you know like, like, like how for example we skip the 13th floor on certain right. mm-hmm. buildings they often skip the fourth floor in China so yeah th- that's that's so many people that have that belief around four Mm-hmm. That it's the opposite of that, that it's, right. you know, a really bad number. Which I think really points out that like f- n- numbers in general and number based sort of magical thinking is very culturally contextual. Like you have to have an entire, there has to be kind of an entire system in place around it to give it meaning. So. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. And, yeah. and what, I guess, which also kind of brings me to a, a point I wanted to say, which, you know, if you're working in a certain system, do the research on their feelings about those numbers uh, or about numbers in general, I guess, because yeah, like if you're working with a, you know, a a Chinese type of system, you're not going to feel the same about four as if you were working with a European one. Right. This is so random, but I I just, can I just say this real quick? Sure. Within, uh, so American girl had um, like uh, dolls that were numbered. That was just like, Hey, you pick one and that's its number and you can name it whatever you want. Well, there was one who had kind of like stereotypically Asian looks mm-hmm. and her number was number four. Mm. And I, I just, I don't know. A, a lot of adult collectors now are like, mm, just a little bit of research. Yeah. Just a little bit. <laughs> but yeah, just, it, it, anyway. Try, try harder. Yeah. yeah. Just please. <laughs> yeah. Okay. M- moving on. Well, so one of the other things is that, in classical, like, and this is in like classical Greek, classical Roman, but Western metaphysics, right? There are four elements, right? There's earth, air, fire, and water. Mm-hmm. So it becomes but, a very foundational number. Yeah, that's true. But not in in China, there's five, right? Yes. So yeah, do you want to get it? Let's get into fives. So yeah, you're right. So in China, really Ta- Taoist folk belief. Yeah, I don't mean to sound so like just reductionist with just in China because obviously there's different people who believe different things <laughs> right there's like a lot in of America. different groups in China this is for folks who kind of ascribe to to Taoist philosophy Taoist metaphysics but they believe in I think it's called the Wu Xian I can't remember and I don't want to I don't want to butcher it but it's the five elements right mm-hmm. earth fire water wood and metal so yeah. air disappears from that but we have wood and metal reintroduced so mm-hmm. Fascinating. Yeah. And originally, I think that was connected to planetary representations, like so the five planets that were known in the sky initially. Okay. So, yeah. Other things with five, obviously five fingers and toes on each hand and foot. Some people say, like you were talking about earlier, counting your yeah. fingers can be a good thing or a bad thing. So, yeah. Yeah. Other stuff. Oh, I mentioned, we mentioned the indigenous beliefs in four in Diné or what's commonly called Navajo beliefs. Five is a lucky number. So it's this, it's maybe related to the idea of this, like a spiritual world in addition to the four directions. So mm. mm-hmm. just like Lilu Dallas, Lilu Dallas <laughs> the fifth element. Well, we we're speaking of that. Do you want to talk about that? The fifth element, the movie. No, uh, come on. I do want to talk about that. I love that movie. Come on, I just love him. I love him so much. Okay. So, yeah. Well, so the number of elements in the revised Western belief, and you put post alchemy. Mm-hmm. So earth, air, fire, water, and then the spirit or animus or numens, which I've not heard. I don't think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then there's like the five points of the body. Think mm-hmm. of the Vitruvian man with mm-hmm. um, Da Vinci. Yes, thank you. I literally almost said DiCaprio and I was like, oh, oh no, that ain't right. <laughs> we are firmly in the 90s tonight with the Counting Crows and <laughs> DiCaprio references. We're firmly into 11 p.m. Yeah. <laughs> okay, anyway, but the, the pentacle and the pentagram and how like, and that was definitely one that I kind of formed a relationship with when, when I wore a, a pentagram a lot was, you know, 
saying, or I, I don't know, like, how I thought of it in my head was like, it symbolized earth, air, fire, and water. And then also the me, but, and then kind of encompassed by the spirit. Mm -hmm. So it, it was the fifth element represented there, but it was also like me as a higher being. Like it, it was my consciousness, I guess. It was, it was kind of your multi-pass to a higher state. I right? love and hate you sometimes. <laughs> I tried to get serious and you pull me back. <laughs> Every time, right back down in the gutter. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. So just to finish your notes here. So the five points of the body, they were once deeply associated with Christianity due to the wounds of Christ, which were yes. two hands, feet as one, a spear mm -hmm. on the side, and then a crown of thorns. Yes. So it was used as a, it was actually used as a symbol for Christians to know each other. It was like a secret society symbol mm -hmm. where Christians would know they could meet in a specific place because there was a pentagram drawn, which is really interesting, right? When you're like, yeah. doors marked with pentagrams is not where you expect to find Christians now. <laughs> I did not know that. That's yeah. cool. Yep. So, and like, I believe... I believe Pythagoreans also used it and they would like actually inscribe it on their hands and so then they could show it to other people and they would know that they were like Pythagoreans basically. So, mm -hmm. so yeah. All right. Six. I could find very little about six. I found two pieces of folklore here. One, when you have six warts, someone can buy them for a penny a piece and they'll go away from North Carolina folklore. And sneezing six times is the indication of a journey, which was from Illinois. And oh. I like both of those. I don't really know what to do with six. So. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yeah. And uh, in card readings, they represent, or at least in playing card readings, they represent like pathways. So, but. it They've never been particularly lucky for me. Like they're, it's always kind of like, oh, it's one away from seven. Right. Like it's just not quite complete. And then also, of course, it has the six, six, six connotation right. which you know kind of growing up in that sort of environment where mm -hmm. like literally like you know if uh, some if a, a fast food order which it would never come to 666 now let me just say but at the time if you know a fast food order came to six dollars 66 cents it was like oh let me add something else on because i'm not paying that number for example right. like, like i remember that happening at least once specifically yeah which is interesting because uh, that it, there's a lot of debate about that and that uh, oh, actually I know. being the number. You I know. know. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we could get into that for sure. But I do think that yeah, the triple six <laughs> can really scare some people. Sure, for sure. Yeah. 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 So, and that's probably that's probably the widest association is that sense of this this triple six being a very scary or negative number. And it is interesting because I, you know, shy away from sixes myself in terms of like, I don't have any positive associations. I don't have a negative association, but it's just kind of a number that doesn't mean much to me. So mm. hmm. I don't know, even though it is my birth month. So take that <laughs> as you will. Um, mm. All right. Sevens, however, have so much lore. Oh yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> Obviously, it's very. There's a lot of biblical stuff that goes with this, so like seven days of the week, and the sort of the hallowing the seventh day. There's a lot of, you know, multiples of seven being holy. So seven times seven, like seven unto seven times seven generations, and things like that, or unto the seventh generation, and all the sort of stuff that that goes into it. So seven is seen as a very kind of like holy number because it is this sense of completion. But, mm -hmm. um, what else? Uh, let's see. Counting seven stars on seven nights for dreams of a future lover or the first person to touch your hand after doing so will be your lover. Yeah. Okay. I don't think yeah. I've heard of that one, but yes, doing things for like something seven times for seven nights that definitely pops up a lot in mm -hmm. witchcraft. I feel like. Yeah. Yeah. Maintaining a, a full one week. Mm hmm spell and we're going to talk about novenas in a little bit but like i was about to say candles yeah you know, a lot of times candle spells will ask people to do do them for a full week right mm -hmm. or if you're doing them for a quote-unquote a month oftentimes what it'll be is it'll be a cycle of four times seven right so it's 28 days that you're supposed oh. to, to do it because that's kind of the lunar cycle basically mm -hmm. so and each each seven days is a quarter of the the lunar cycle so there's seven that too. Seven days. 
Sorry. The Before ring. Die, you see the ring. Yeah. It ruined me. <laughs> I mean, again, really firmly in the 90s here. I also thought this piece of lore was really interesting. So if you keep something seven years, you are supposed to keep it forever. And you can't you can't get rid of it. It'll always come back to you. Mm. And I've never heard that. Yeah. But yeah. I bear with me. It <laughs> it automatically made me think of okay, they they say, you know, whoever the this ominous they is, that like your cells regenerate fully uh -huh. every like seven years and you're not the same person you were. And I know it's like it's scientifically bullshit. I know that. Mm -hmm. But like the idea is there and it's almost like there, there's something about seven years of just being like a different person. And it's mm -hmm. like, well, if, if you've kept it through that cycle of your life, then yeah, it's destined to stay with you. Yeah. Yeah. And there's, you know, there are fairy tales that have to do with, you know, if you, you somebody be somebody will be in service to, you know, the devil or some other entity for seven years. Right. So yeah, there's a sense of like seven years is this sort of cycle and I think in Jewish lore, I know the 50th year was the Jubilee year. So it's a bit, that was after the seven times seven. So you'd go through 49 years and then in the 50th year, you'd have the Jubilee year oh. as the completion. And that was when you were supposed to release everybody from their debts, release, if you had slaves, you're supposed to release any slaves or servants and allow them to, to go free and things like that. And there were these, you know, festivals and things like that that would happen so and so that was this idea of like a cycle coming to completion so uh -huh. yeah yeah oh and then seven year itch which i think is at least related to this idea of you keep something seven years and so people ha you know experience this quote-unquote seven year itch do, do you know what this concept is if you heard this concept yeah yeah i okay. mean to me what i know it as is basically i mean I think it could probably be applied to many different things, but I mainly know it as just like a marriage thing of once mm -hmm. you get in about seven years, it's like you get, you get a little twitchy and you get like, Hmm, I, I, is this what I really want for the rest of my life right. type of thing? And I think a lot of people tend to struggle around seven years in on their marriage. And, you know, I, I think that's a common, common thing. Yep. Yeah. And if you think about that in terms of the lore, right, if you can keep someone seven years, then you get them forever. Right. 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 <laughs> but that seventh year, that's the that's the one where they're going to get really antsy. So, yeah. So that's the time to start doing all those like stay at home spells. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Good. For yourself um, or your spouse, depending on your feelings. Right. A little of both. Why not? Yeah, it's, a, yeah. it's a cooperative thing. Yeah. It could be at like a job too, you know, like if you've mm -hmm. been in a job for a long time, you, you know, you, once you get to seven years, you might start to think like, mm, is this the right job for me or, or whatever. Yeah. Um, and then I know you said seven is like a huge number in lore. So it's going to be in storytelling as well. But, you mm -hmm. know, like I said, with um, the ring, you know, she, yeah. you get seven days um, and then Snow White and the seven dwarves, you sure. know, there's just, there's yeah. a lot of seven in, in things like that. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. It's definitely like threes and sevens are kind of the two big mythology fairy tale numbers that you yeah. see. And yeah. then, I mean, and that's not to say the other numbers are not important too. Well, we're going to get to nines. Nines are important as well. But, you know, those two really dominate. So, yeah. Yeah. Before we get to nine, your number. I mean, I'm always a little afraid of leaving seven because seven gets mad and we know what happens. Then seven, eight, nine. So, <laughs> yeah, it gets hungry, I guess. I guess um, so. Yeah. So, eight, like I said, that's my personal favorite number. There wasn't a whole lot of lore with eight. There were a lot of like, use eight drops of whatever when you're doing like folk medicine, which I thought was really interesting. Oh, or that like is. something that, you know, you have to take something for eight days or, you know, use it for eight weeks. There was one hiccup cure, which was eight deep breaths. Mm -hmm. So, I just thought that was interesting that eight is so associated with healing. Yeah. Uh, what I would have associated it with, but there it is. I don't know that I I would either. Yeah. But what I mean, what do you associate it with? Because, like you said, infinity and and the the luck, obviously. But yeah, for me, it's like I don't know. It's it's right between that seven and nine for mm -hmm. me. So it's just again, it doesn't feel quite complete, even though it it kind of should, you know, it's an, it's easily divisible <laughs> by mm -hmm. two and, you know, you can just half it right down the middle. It, it should feel like 
stable or something to me, but it just doesn't. I, I know I, I know that so much of this is just like personal feeling and you may feel completely different about all, all these different numbers. Mm-hmm. So maybe listen to this isn't <laughs> completely educational or whatever, but I don't know. That's just, that's just how I, I see it. What about you? No, I mean, I, like I said, I have strong associations. It's, it, it isn't that infinity thing. So for me, that's kind of where it really comes from is that it's not so much that it's divisible down the middle. It's that it's this sort of continually and perpetually ongoing cycle and this sort of this change. It's, it's a number of change and expansion to me. So it's like mm. two times two times two, right? It's this elevation to elevation to elevation. Like when you think about something growing exponentially, right? Okay. Which is what two does when it becomes eight. You know, initially it's just sort of squaring itself, but once it's cubing, it's starting to grow exponentially. So it's this expansive, very like fortune oriented number, like good luck mm. and good fortune. So okay. Love that. Yeah. That's kind of how I think of it. Yeah. And there's no end to it because it's right. infinity. Right. Okay. And then you can kind of, you know, if you did two times two times two times two, right, you're going to get into that. It's what, 16, right? So it's going to, I don't know, it just kind of keeps exp- expanding beyond that. And I sort of love that. So mm. cool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. So nine? Nines. Lots of stuff on nines. Uh, I will say, I was initi- I was at one point taught while I was learning Southern Conjure that nine is a cursing number and you use nine. If you want to curse somebody, you're going to mix nine ingredients together or you're going to do a spell over nine days to curse them. So I wonder if there's a reason behind that. I mean, it is associated with a lot of magic. I don't know why specifically it would be cursing over everything else. I think it has to do with the fact that it's not quite 10. It's not quite complete, but I don't know. And see, 10 doesn't feel complete at all to me, but I, I get your point. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 10 feels like a, I don't know, like a stopping point. I don't know, but it's not a completion point. Right. So yeah. It's another tick, you know, it's where mm-hmm. you, yeah. And it, we should say like, there's obviously positive uses for this too. We mentioned the Novena, the nine night candle spell, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let's see. There's nine worlds in Norse mythology. Mm-hmm. And nine herbs in the Anglo-Saxon charm. What's that? Yeah. What's the Anglo-Saxon charm? So there's an Anglo-Saxon herb charm that, charm that names nine different herbs as kind of the sacred herbs. Uh, now that you put it like that. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, it's these nine sacred herbs. I'm trying to remember what they are. They're, now that I couldn't tell you. Yeah, I can't remember it. I've got a friend who who is really, really knowledgeable about this, and, and they have a tattoo of all of the different cool. ones on their arm, or they're expanding it slowly to do, to do all those. But I can't remember what all of them are. I know I think plantain is one of them. Okay. But but there's a there's a whole like whole bunch of them that are part of the sort of Anglo Saxon lore to do with that. I think what is it? It's I found a little chart that shows it and plantain is one of them. But it can't be right because cayenne is on there and cayenne is a new world. <laughs> <laughs> it's a new world plant so that's not it but and this is new world wit- witchery but that ain't what we're talking about right now <laughs> no we're talking about old world yeah but anyway so yeah so but th- that has that kind of historical root to it let's see is this nine sacred herbs oh i don't know oh that's all in runic and i can't read runic so we're just gonna <laughs> we're just gonna assume anyway i'm i could google all day long i'm probably never gonna be able to which problem yeah Oh, wait, that's in runic. <laughs> that's in runic. I, know, I can't read runic right now. Yeah. But anyway, if you Google the Anglo-Saxon nine herbs charm, I'm pretty sure you will you will run into it. Oh, okay. So here it's showing mugwort, plantain, fennel. That sounds, cor- that sounds correct. Yeah. Okay. So those ones I think are correct. An apple ends up being in there too, I think. So hmm. yeah. Okay. Nettle. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that makes more sense. So yeah, if you Google this, you're going to be able to find that more easily. But yeah, so these nine sacred herbs that represent kind of nine different sort of properties of healing and magic and things like that. Yeah. So, and nine again is a cube, right? It's a three by three cube, so it's a prime cube, which gives it some power. Mm. Yeah. Or it's a square, I'm sorry, not a cube. I... I... I don't even like, I didn't even pick up on it. <laughs> <laughs> like again, the college algebra was not my forte. <laughs> Fail. Oh my goodness. Okay. So that brings us to nine. 
Did you have any other associations with nine? I mean, I guess nine months. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Even though it's yeah. it's kind of it's not really nine, mm-hmm. but yeah, that's just the general like what we say for gestation, and so yeah. that de- that definitely has some some meaning, I guess. Yeah, and one other one, and tell me if you heard this one or not, but I remember when I was learning kind of in Wiccan practice, when you made your magic circle, it was supposed to be nine feet across in diameter. Do you remember that? Oh, I don't know that I do, but if someone had said that that's, that they had learned that, I'd be like, yeah, that sounds about right. Just because yeah. it's three times three. Yeah. So and, I, yeah, I don't know. And even <laughs> in the craft, uh-huh. like uh, they don't say like the number nine, but they, like in the, the movie, they say by the power of three times three. Uh-huh like whatever, whatever, some mode it be or something like that. But I don't know. I always remembered that being like, you know, why are they, why are they not saying like just by the power of three or the power of nine? Why is it three times three? Right. And and how kind of interesting that was. And I know, again, you know, it's a movie, but they did have a real witch on set who was kind of um, helping them with certain things. Yeah. I think, wasn't it Silver Raven Wolf? Oh, I don't know. I It was, it was definitely a, high priestess of a certain coven that was near where they were filming, I believe, but I don't know that it was. Yeah. I don't, I don't remember. But I, yeah, don't I, I could be very wrong on that. I, I can't remember I, who I, it was, but yeah. So, okay. So that's nine. Then we come around to like 10 or zero. And I do think it's worth at least mentioning zero has its own. It, there's not so much a lore about it, but it does have this kind of interesting presence where it is null, right? It is this, it is the absence of something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, I don't know. Kind do you of have a weird concept. Yeah, it's just weird when you think about it. Like, it's, mm-hmm. it represents the absence of something. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it only appeared, I think it only appeared once kind of Arabic mathematicians realized that they needed something to represent that, that nothingness or that absence. Right. And up to that yeah. point, people just hadn't really conceptualized that, so... Yeah, I think I've read I've read that too. That that it can, mm-hmm. kind of developed later. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was one of one of the, kind of the last numbers to be developed for arithmetic. But it's also kind of like a foundational number in the sense of like we often think of things coming from nothing, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, but, but yeah, interesting. Eleven. We did kind of mention elevens when we talked about ones as kind of a repetition and a power number. And then you've talked a little bit about thirteen. Mm-hmm. This is how it was lucky for me, but for a lot of people, it's a bad luck number. I, mm-hmm. You know, it, it has its own phobia name, it's which like is Triskaidekaphobia. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm sorry, um, I cut in on you on that one. No, you're fine. <laughs> I, I'm excited when I know phobias too. I'm like, yes, I know that one. <laughs> so yeah, that's definitely a bad luck number for a lot of people. But I don't know. I think it's kind of become a it's where it's changed a little bit where it's almost kind of, you know, cheeky to have it as a, a good luck type of number. Yeah. Um, yeah. Something I didn't know until joining the tattoo club was that the fr- Friday the 13th and like, those are the days that you can get cheap tattoos. So oh yeah. That's like they do flash, flash art. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. yeah. Pretty fun. Yeah. Anything else for 13th? I mean, you have the movie. Friday the 13th, but that came about because of the superstition yeah. of the number. Yeah. I mean, you did talk about 13 people at a table mm-hmm. as well. So, and I mean, you, we could go on and on. I don't want to like belabor too many other numbers, but like a lot of numbers, you know, once you're starting into multiples of tens, right? Like the number 40 has this biblical significance, 40 days and 40 nights, 40, you know, years in the desert, 40 mm-hmm. days in the desert for Jesus wandering around. Yeah. You know, so those those are supposed to represent other things. You know, there's a lot of numbers that we could dig into here. So we've really kind of only covered a baseline of these, but I feel yeah. like it was worth doing and unpacking yeah. some of this. Yeah. So. That's true. So yeah. Yeah. And I mean we could again we can go bigger, we can get into like thousands and you know, various, you know, nine 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 and you know, we talked about six 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 and seven 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 <laughs> and all these things. That have significance. There's so many numbers, obviously, <laughs> an infinite amount of them. In fact, <laughs> so, <laughs> don't even do negatives. But we like, didn't. yeah. So there's so much. I mean, pi. We really should have talked about pi and kind of its role. Um, but you know, I don't know how many people are magically using. Pi. Well, I don't know. I'd eat a magical pie. I don't know. 
Um, but anyway, so there's a lot of numbers that we could dig into. This is just kind of a baseline run through, but I'm curious about other people's thoughts on numbers. I'm sure people know lore that we have not even touched on. I, I certainly invite people to, to send that our way. So please do. Mm-hmm. I feel like we could have several more episodes on numerology. <laughs> Uh, quite a number of them in fact yes yeah. quite a number <laughs> okay on that pun we're going to pause for just a minute and we're going to come back and we've got a couple of listener emails to do all right do you want to do this first one sure okay Martha says, greetings to all. I have a question about a problem I'm having. I recently moved to a retirement community and my neighbor is putting little drops of something that looks brown in front of my door and along the sidewalk. What can I do to cleanse this? I'm so distraught. Please help. Sincerely, Martha. Yeah. And I mean, so I have to say, you know, we don't know specifically what they're putting in front of this person's door. For all we know, this could be like a disinfectant. It could be, you know, you know, they might be doing mold treatment or something like that, that we just don't know about. But if we're assuming that they're putting something negative magically down, I figure we can at least answer what would we do in the situation where we thought somebody was leaving something on our doorstep that is causing negative effects. So I'm curious, what would you do in that situation, Lane? Um, I'd call you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. I know. I know. I know. My- it's- I no, my mean, ego is well inflated now. Thank you. No, I don't mean it to be a cop out. I literally don't know what I would do. And I would call you and be like, help. What do I do? So here, here we go. You'd be like this mother. <laughs> Put some shiz on my doorstep. What are we going to do? <laughs> okay. Yeah, I need to bring in the big guns. That's you. Oh, oh, that's sweet. I like being the big guns. I mean, the first thing I would do is I would say, make sure that you clean your house in general really, really well back to front, out the front door, just get anything in there just just to get it clean, just to give yourself a baseline, open all the windows, bang some pots and pans, ring some bells, just get everything kind of like out of your house that could be lingering. And then this doorstep area where they're leaving stuff, I would specifically cleanse that with a wash water made with um, a little bit of ammonia or urine as a way to sort of break their mark on your space and reclaim it for yourself. You could also add in some lemons, some salt, things that generally kind of purge or remove things. And then, you know, if you're worried about them kind of coming back, I would, you know, put down maybe some red brick dust or some chalk kind of around the area where they would have to walk over it so that whatever they're bringing in, its its power is broken before they can even put it down. So that would be kind of what I would do. How do you feel about all that? Yeah, I like your idea of chalk and using sidewalk chalk to write Mm -hmm. like sigils or protective things because it washes away really easily. But I like to think that the (laughs) power is still there. Yeah. (laughs) So, yeah, I I really like that idea. Okay. So that's, yeah, that's kind of where I would go is, you know, clean everything out, push everything out that front door, you know, throw some, you know, some of your wash water out to the, the, setting sun so that it takes it away. Then once you've done that, that's when you lay down your stuff on that, your own kind of cleansing and blockade work on that front door. And and again, kind of wash wherever she's putting this, these drops, wash that with something that's strong and purgative. I mean, if you, you know, you can even just use pine salt and water if you need to, or lemon pine salt and water. That'll, that'll be a good like starting point and then put down something that basically makes it so that if she crosses the line again, whatever she's doing, just it can't get through. It can't do anything. It just becomes null. So does that work for you? Yeah, works for me. All right. All right. Here, you can read the second one too because it's cute. Okay. <laughs> hello there, lovely humans. Oh, hello. Thank you. Hello. I was just listening to the anti-curses episode and I got to the bit where Corey mentioned the practice of kicking coconuts around the house to cleanse it, which of course led to the Monty Python reference about coconuts. As my brain also went there and filled in the line, are you suggesting coconuts migrate? I thought I'd share they actually do. (laughs) Y'all might already know that, that, but it's true. They drop into the ocean and float around. So yes, coconuts do in fact migrate. Anyway, I just had to share. (laughs) Love the podcast. Listener, Trisha. (laughs) Thank you, Trisha. We love that too. We really do. <laughs> oh, I love it. Migrating coconuts. Adore. Adore it. 
Okay, Lane, I think we're going to finish up here then with our question of the episode, which I said is, since we're doing numbers, what is your number one goal for witchcraft this year? Mine is simply to just do more of it. Just, okay. I, I, I fall back on things I know a lot and I want to, you know, explore a few different methods or spell books or just ideas. I don't know. I just want to get my hands dirty more this year, you know? Yeah. I like that. And not to sound too weird with how I just phrased that, but also like to do more witchcraft with you because Mm -hmm. you are closer and we've been able to hang out a little bit more and, you know, we, but we haven't actually done like witchcraft that wasn't, um, thousands of miles away right like because i think we did one ritual together that was still separate though and it was you know like timed and everything but that was that's been it in years so i really would like to do something and you know we've been talking about like doing some sort of ritual for the book of like you know mm-hmm. kind of like a a closing but also like a hey you know <laughs> do, yeah. do your best out there do your do your best <laughs> so so yeah that's my very long answer what about you uh, it's funny because your your second half of your answer kind of ties into mine, which is to do more witchcraft with other people. Because nice. I would like to, I would like to be a little more socially witchy this year. I've nice. been, you know, I'm in a I'm in a position where I am craving more social interaction. <laughs> so, so I kind of want to get out there and, and do some more stuff. And and you know, absolutely with you, a friend of mine and I exchange tarot readings from time to time via text. Mm-hmm. So that's been really good had some good discussions on discord with our folks there, but I do want to like get together and like do physical kind of magical work with other people. So I think that's kind of a big one for me this year. Yeah. Same. All right. And and I want to help each, like I want us to help each other, you know, for sure do that. Love that. All right. Well, if we're going to keep each other accountable, I think the listeners can also keep us accountable, which means that they can write to us with questions about this episode or any others or corrections or information about coconut migration practices, whatever they want to do, or quotes from 90s movies, because apparently that's what we do on this show. <laughs> um, but uh, if they want to do that, where can they do that, Lane? Let's see. They can email us at compassandkey at gmail.com. Yes. Or New World Retreat Podcast at gmail.com. Both of those will reach us. Um, if they want to find over 200 articles on North American folk magic, uh, plus all of our social media and everything like that, they can go to newworldbetree.com slash find dash us, or I'm sorry, find hyphen us. That'll get you kind of pretty much everything on our website. Newworldbetree.com is where we have all of our podcasts, including ones that seem to not show up in everybody's podcatchers. So if you're looking for some of our older episodes, they're there too. So. Yeah, because we've been going for how long now? What We're going into our 15th year? About to, yeah. yeah. Like, speaking of numbers, my friend. <laughs> I know, decade and a half. We're we're pushing it, so Ooh. it's a lot. Halfway to retirement. <laughs> I'm going to get that gold watch. <laughs> she only had one more year left on the podcast. <laughs> she was going <laughs> to retire to a little island off the coast of Florida. <laughs> And they got to They, they got to They cast a spell. Now she's a rabbit. <laughs> uh, if you turn into a rabbit, I would take very good care of you. So. Oh, thank you. <laughs> that actually makes me... <laughs> Sorry. I must be like, this. it's just getting late because I'm that emotional right now. Because I'm like, oh. you, hate, you hate rabbits. That's so kind. <laughs> <laughs> You're the one rabbit I would care for. Yes. Okay, go ahead. Oh, what else we got? Oh, uh, if you, I don't imagine you could possibly want to support us at all at this point. <laughs> but if for some reason you found a need to do that, you could go to patreon.com slash new world witchery. A uh, dollar a month, whatever you can afford, it helps us out, helps to make the show better, and leads to some nice perks. Hopefully, perks that'll be going out fairly soon to some of our, our Patreon supporters. So, yes. Yeah, yes. we're a little overdue on that, but we, yes, we, we are. We're but catch up on but we got it planned. We got it scheduled out. Corey and I are hitting the ground running with it yep absolutely uh, yeah so i think that'll about do us I, I guess we should mention you know if you're interested in if you like buffy the vampire slayer oh yeah you know, we're gonna actually have a little crossover episode coming up with our buffy podcast where we're going to talk about black and white magic and things like that so if you have any interest at all in buffy you should check out our podcast and that might be a good episode to kind of join in and, 
and do some crossover work. So yeah, because they're not always episode recaps. Sometimes yeah. we talk about pop culture and yeah. uh, influences, things of that nature. Anyway, yeah. it's fun. Yeah, we just did the myth of the robots. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's fun. So if you want to learn about robots and the fiction and lore, there it is. So <laughs> cool. Well, Lane, you are amazing and I am definitely your number one fan. So I think Same. we can close up on that. Same here. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thanks for listening. Be well. New World Witchery is a production of New World Witchery Podcasts and is released under Creative Commons Share and Share Alike license. The title and closing music for this episode is Woman Blues by Paul Avgernos, licensed from Audio Socket. <laughs>